staking is here. It's ready for prime time. It is a two-way door of getting in and out. And we want to grow that overall participation of staking on the network. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. Today, we are talking about LSDs. This is not a psychedelics episode. Today, we are talking about liquid staking derivatives. Basically, as Ethereum moves from proof of work to proof of stake, you are able to stake your Ethereum. The downside of that is that that ETH is now locked up. It is a kind of dead asset. So what has been created is are these things called liquid staking derivatives, which um, allows you to have liquidity on that staked ETH. So a couple of the major players in this space are Coinbase with their CV ETH product, uh, Rocket Pool, um, Lido, which we'll be talking about. And this episode kind of is going to focus on two different things like liquid staking and then just the staking market in general. And we're really lucky to be joined by Darren, who is the GM of Rocket Pool's core team. And then uh, John, who is the product lead, uh, one of the product leads at Coinbase. He helped lead the launch of CVE and now leads all staking at Coinbase. So Darren, uh, John, welcome. Welcome to Empire, guys. Thank you very much for having me. So, uh, Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited about this. John, is this is this podcast number one for you? Uh, I think of any podcast worth note, uh, which I'd put you in that camp, but uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit more under the radar on some of these things. So I'm a bit happy. Good way to start the show. B- butter me up. Say the, say the podcast is noteworthy. I, I like your strategy. <laughs> God, I'm just hoping for the softballs, baby. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a- I'm making notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Well, maybe John, because, because you buttered me up so kindly, I'll, I'll throw this first one to you, which is, uh, Staking LSD is like really just in in a, a hot button topic, obviously because of uh, everything that happened with Kraken and settlement. You guys have your own product, uh, CBE. Um, I'd love to just get like a lay of the land. Like, give me the you know we're coming up on Shanghai. We've got a couple big players. You guys, uh, Rax is making some movements. Obviously, Lido is kind of the dominant player right now. Like, give me the lay of the land of what's going on in in LSDs and staking world right now. Absolutely. So the way I frame it is that, you know, staking in general has been live for, I don't know, approximately two years or so. And we've seen over that time period already some pretty monumental shifts in market share. I think one of the very first considerations to have and when examining the landscape is native staking versus liquid staking, and also kind of where it is home staking or DIY fit in. And generally what we've seen is kind of, you know, over time that home staking contingent, I think rests around like 25-ish percent is kind of where we are today. And these are do it yourself, stand up your own node validator um, in your home and, and, and run a couple of these validators on your own hardware. Um, and then we've seen that a lot of the centralized exchanges have built staking as a service programs. Um, and that was kind of the next wave where you had Kraken, um, ourselves at Coinbase, um, uh, Binance, of course, and then a number of others, Bitcoin Suisse, uh, Stakefish, Stake.us, Celsius even. There are a lot of these centralized providers who then began offering staking. Um, and I think then the, the, the most recent inflection in the market was when Lido began to really gain steam. They launched their STE token. Um, it immediately started to get some traction, especially as they went through the different DeFi integrations. So that utility built up for STE. And then what we saw when we looked at this, uh, the market share over time, is the inflection of Lido's dominance really happened after their Aave integration. And that's what kicked off a lot of additional usage of LSDs in DeFi for many as different strategies and, and um, approaches. But that was when we, I think, really saw Lido rocket to the top as the number one provider of staking through the format of ST. Darren, how do you do? What are, what are we missing here in terms of like lay of the land, end of February, what's going on in the staking and LSD space that like from someone who lives in it 24-7? Yeah, so Lido definitely um, kind of took the lead in terms of they, they, did, they did it very, very well in, in the sense that they they created a lot of liquidity um which then uh, kind of gave them that utility um for st for st uh again yeah as john said the, the Abe thing was was very very um, good for them um 
a lot of other uh, kind of players came into the market a little bit later. Um, so obviously we came in around kind of November um, of, of uh, 21, um, uh, kind of onto mainnet and started building up some steam. Um, and then John could talk about um, you know, uh, CBE um, as well. Um, so, and then there's a lot of other kind of players like Stakewise and, and a few other people as well who are, are kind of um, you know, developing these protocols and uh, gaining, I guess, mind share at the very least, if not, if not, kind of market share as well. Hmm. Um, and so that that's definitely that's definitely been an ongoing process. Obviously, with the merge, the merge was a big, big, big thing for um, staking protocols. So I, I thought I think. <laughs> the our kind of TVL chart is ridiculous. It uh, you, you, that's kind of like it, it's a steady, steady growth until until the merge, and then suddenly it just goes bam. Uh, where you know the merge was a massive de-risking event for the whole of Ethereum, um, but particularly for Ethereum staking. So that is the you know that that was the kind of like a, a big a big moment. Yeah, I'm looking at the market share numbers right now, which are. Uh, this, I mean, this is according to DeFi Llama. Seventy-three. Lido has seventy-three percent of the market uh, market share. CBE has fifteen to sixteen percent of the market share. Rocket Pool has six percent of the market share, and Frax has like one to one point five percent of the market share. Why does someone? Maybe Darren, I'll throw this one to you first. Like, why does someone choose to stake with one of those versus someone else? Like, what's the when I'm going to stake? Like, what what is the product decision that I'm making there? I think there's a there's a few different things. Um, the first, well, actually, so the first one is um, the kind of style of token, and um, so there are different styles of token um, that does play into it a little bit, in the sense that um, so um, there are kind of non rebasing tokens and rebasing tokens. Rebasing tokens kind of have this daily increase of quantity um, that you get, and non rebasing tokens actually increase by value over time. Um, and there's some kind of advantages and disadvantages of each approach, um, namely kind of like tax efficiency and that sort of thing. Uh, Non-rebasing tokens tend to be more tax efficient. Um, so that's one element of it. Probably the most driving um, factor is is utility. Um, as John said, you know the RB integration um, uh, was 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 very is is key um, because it allows people to do kind of hyper staking, uh, which is kind of essentially leveraged um, um, staking. So, you know, utility is, is the biggest is the biggest thing. And so different um different um tokens have different um maturities in the market. And you have to have a maturity in the market and you have to have a certain amount of liquidity to kind of get these integrations. And in fact, it's kind of like a Maslow's um hierarchy of integrations. Uh you have like liquidity on the bottom, then eventually you get into kind of like lending markets. Um, once you get into lending markets, then that that then um, enables you to get into like yield aggregators and and a lot of other kind of protocols as well. So there's this kind of like um, stepped approach, and you have to work through each of those and um, kind of go up that pyramid um, to be able to do it. So tokens that have been in the market for longer will will have more will will have more utility. Um, so that's that's kind of the thing. And then the, obviously it's it's with some of it's um, like the Decentralization spectrum as well. Um, you know, different validator sets. Um, uh, you know, each each um, each liquid staking protocol has a different validator set, and that definitely comes into play um, when you when you look at that. Um, and then and then the last thing is brand, obviously. Um, I think I don't I don't know whether it's in that order or not, but it's 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 that around that sort of way. Yeah. To tag on to that, um, I think. A lot of those points that Darren made are, are great points and particularly like a big plus one to his points around utility and the hierarchy of needs or the step, like the, the, the order of operations you need to follow in order to build that utility. Um, we've experienced the same with CBE and we've gone through those processes. So very, very much agree. Um, I would also add that like if we take ourselves kind of one layer up and maybe zoom out even a bigger to a bigger extent. I think the market shares, um, you know, that, that you provided there, Jason, are all around you know, liquid staking derivatives or um, liquid staking tokens, as we like to call them here at Coinbase, uh, more than anything else. And if you actually look at kind of the overall market share landscape, um, the differences aren't quite as wide, right? Do so you have like 
from my view, like Lido has about 29% of market share, Coinbase 15, Kraken 7.5, Binance about 6, Rocket Pool around 2.5-ish percent um, when you look on those total bases. So I would almost also say that like when a customer is thinking hey John, what's, about- what's that from? Like, why are my numbers so different than your numbers? What's the what's the metric? What's the right metric that I should be looking at? Because I think I'm looking at the wrong stuff then. Yeah, well, you what the the market share you might have given is on just the LSDs, whereas I look yes. at the total underlying stake ETH across both native and liquid stake. Ah, uh, so that doesn't include like Kraken staking arm or whatever. That it, that's I right. see. Okay, it's right. And and Binance is too, right? I mean, they where did, where do you find that data? data? Where where can I pull that up? I love on the Hill Dobby dashboard on Dune. Um, oh, nice. I can send you. Is there a link? I can add it in the chat. I can find it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's one of the ones that we've used. And then looking at the total stake overall in the network, and then kind of comparing each of these providers uh, against that number. Um, so yeah, to 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 get back to the point, right? Is like that if you look kind of first on that kind of outer lens, you, you do kind of have a chance to sit back and say, okay, well, if we put ourselves in the perspective of the customers and in the customer's shoes, there really is kind of a um, spectrum of sophistication and knowledge when it comes to staking. You've got very normy novice stakers who might be in a centralized exchange product already seeing, hey, there's this opportunity to earn APYs on these assets that I'm buying and holding. That sounds like a great use of my proceeds during a bear market while I'm just holding and accumulate. And then you probably you go up the sophistication spectrum, you're going to land at the you know advanced traders up to the Web3 hedge funds and VC funds who are actively using these tokens. So if we kind of you know use this framing of the customers, you might also say that how those customers are, ch- are choosing their different staking provider does also base on kind of what level of knowledge they're coming in at. The more no, like more me and novice users are probably most comfortable with a solution that might or might not have an LSD associated with it to just be able to get in, earn that interest uh, or those rewards, and then continue to you know just sit and hold. But as those users are more sophisticated, those who are kind of like you know accustomed to using self custody wallets, interacting on chain, um, or up to those crypto hedge funds that are trying to maximize returns. That's where I think LSDs become increasingly important for that top segment of the market. And those uh, uh, user groups are, number one, looking to you know, maximize their total proceeds and profit, which does involve um, some of those strategies that Darren mentioned in using those different DeFi protocols. But another huge one, especially when you're at that institution level, is your security and uh, trust in the safety of the underlying ETH uh, state ETH. And so that's another, I think, big component here, which is it's not just utility and how much you could use the token and how much profit you can earn from it, but how comfortable do you feel with the security of the underlying storage model? And some of these, um, you know, mileage may vary between different providers. And I think one of the reasons why there is a lot of faith in Lido is because there's a little bit of that um, Lindy effect, that it's been around, it has been tested, and there's confidence in the underlying um, security model. Darren... Can I just, so, okay, so I have like a very, um, I have like a five-year-old's take on staking, which I see like a spectrum of staking platforms. And I'm like, uh, centralized staking platforms, Coinbase, Kraken, Binance, uh, p- folks like that. I'm like, okay, those are the centralized folks. Then I'm like, all right, then there's like the middle bucket. And I've got like my Lidos of the world in the middle bucket. And then I'm like, all right, then there's the like very pro decentralization rocket pools of the world. So mm-hmm. that's my like five-year-old's brain view of staking i guess darren like one is that a fair view or not a fair view and then two like why do you think it's obviously you're spending your time at rocket pool helping to like further this like decentralized staking mission like why is that a cause worth fighting yeah i, I think that's that's kind of like a, a a fair assessment of the of the market um particularly around the validator set so obviously you know um, we're having you know, from centralized having you know one one provider or um, you know, uh, control over over the validator set to kind of us where we have over two thousand um, individual node operators. So I, I guess yeah, we've spent kind of a long time building uh, our protocol. Uh, Rocket Pool's been around for six years, and um, so ever since 
uh, staking was a, a even mentioned for it as a thing on Ethereum. We've been around, so um, we, we we have spent a long time kind of building our protocol, and um, and so the reason why we do that is because um, so Ethereum you know, aims so Ethereum's health kind of depends on it being decentralized. Um, it and when I say decentralized, decentralization is a is a characteristic. Um, but it's not necessarily the outcome. The outcome that you get from decentralization is uh, credible neutrality. Um, uh, it's censorship resistance. Um, it's uh, resiliency. Um, it's all of those kind of things um, that we want from an L1 blockchain. Um, and so it, it is really important that we, um, we, we decentralize the validator set as much as possible. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that's why we kind of, that's why, why we approach it in that way and why we spend quite a lot of time doing it that way. And it is actually a very hard problem. <laughs> uh, there, there are new kind of protocols coming through at the moment. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're perfectly comfortable with, with competition. And I think it's good that we there is competition in, in the marketplace, um, particularly for, you know, running validators. Um, as we've kind of seen um, with Lido, uh, so, uh, one, or, you know, one entity or one pool having um, a lot of control over the um, over the validator set is not a good thing for for Ethereum. So um, we need we need competitors in the marketplace. Um, at the same time, building a decentralized protocol is is very very difficult. Um, so yeah, so yeah. That, that we've kind of managed to do that over the last six years. Yeah. What well, I mean, you guys are, I guess, on on, on my five year old's view of staking, like on two ends of the spectrum. So maybe, maybe competing with each other there, but like you're also both on the same team going after the like 800 pound gorilla in the space, which is Lido. What do you think is like, is it like, why is it bad if Lido gains too much of the market share? What's the, what are the negative re, uh, ramifications of that? I can at least chime in to say that, you know, um, there's a lot of push that we saw amongst you know in the ethereum community as lido kind of approached the 33 percent first consensus threshold of uh our you know proof of stake consensus in ethereum i think there would be the ultimate top limit there is that like 66.7 percent of upper threshold at which point um if there was full control over the validators then a single provider would be able to distort and pervert the state of the network uh, now, very importantly, what a lot of us talk about in the Ethereum community is that there is still this all-important social layer that stands on top of the protocol layer. And I think if we ever got to a position where the protocol itself had been captured by like a 70% holder of market share, that social layer would probably overrule and then work towards uh, rectifying the situation, either through some kind of um, specialized slashing, a hard fork, other sort of tools. Um, that are at the discretion of the community, you know, hopefully we never have to approach that. Um, and the community works towards um, a more decentralized future. And and let me, you know, kind of just take this opportunity to remind folks that, sure, like, you know, Darren and team might have, um, you know, our ETH, Coinbase is a big proponent of CBE. Um, but ultimately, even if we are competing on these, you know, like our flavors at the same thing, we should take an Ethereum first approach here. Um, and we are, I think, at first and foremost, like Ethereans in this regard. Um, we need to think of the whole state of the network as extremely important and central to our mission here at Coinbase. You know, one of our missions is to increase economic freedom in the world. And we can only do that if we have like a truly neutral, uncensorable, permissionless base layer of Ethereum. That's number one. Like That needs to come first and foremost amongst all of our decisions and actions. And I think if you take that lens, we can also take a pro Ethereum stance, which is to say, like, when you look at all Ethereum staked versus total supply, we're only at about 14%. So there's a ton of opportunity to grow the pie rather than trying to fight for market share within the pie. Mm -hmm. And I think that posturing ourselves in the community in advance of the Shanghai upgrade and move to the enablement of withdrawals, that's like the next big catalyst that we can use to inform everyone out there, all ETH holders, that staking is here, it's ready for prime time, it is a two-way door of getting in and out, 
And we want to grow that overall participation of staking on the network. Mm -hmm. One, can you guys explain this deal that happened last month, which was, um, so like, I think of you guys as competitors here, but then in last month, uh, Coinbase joined Rocket Pool's ODAO, um, and Coinbase Ventures announced an investment in, in, uh, Rocket Pool. So like, maybe, maybe this is a question for Darren here. Can, can you explain that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I should say, I should caveat it with, um, they've been proposed to the Odell. Um, they, they, they still need to be accepted. Um, uh, but, um, uh, yes. So, so yeah, this is, um, so this is important because so Coinbase, um, as, as John said, you know, everyone is, you know, they're, they're kind of an Ethereum first, um, kind of company, um, they want to invest in uh, decentralized technology um and so coinbase ventures is the is the kind of the bc arm of of coinbase and it's actually them who um who we're kind of dealing with um and so they've actually um uh done like an rpl investment um so it's 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 essentially you know kind of buying rpl and investing in that what they intend to do, they intend to kind of run some um, some mini pools um, to kind of you know, increase the capacity of Ari. Um, it's not in terms of the in network network itself. It's not going to be a significant percentage of that, um, but they um, they are kind of um, going to be running mini pools, um, so that they are kind of investing in um, and want to be a part of you know, decentralized protocols. Uh, Coinbase Ventures are like one member out of. I think we have 16 uh, members um, on the ODA at the moment. Um, and so what it, what it really does is it kind of um, means that we are you know, together on that kind of endeavor. Um, yeah, so there you go. Nice. I think the only two cents I can add to that is, you know, um, Coinbase's mission, right, as I mentioned before, is to increase economic freedom in the world. And that is a attitude we take across our product portfolio to focus on how do we you know, grow that mission and grow the ecosystem at large first, because we, we, we realize how small the whole ecosystem is relative to its future end state. And we view this kind of on the same paradigm of um, the internet and, and this internet of value that we're building. And so we take this view that it is very early. And if you look at kind of our product portfolio at Coinbase from the you know, consumer app that the flagship app that everyone knows and and hopefully loves um, to you know the Web three wallet, which is now a feature within that app to allow people to kind of have this um, semi self custodied um, approach that's based on MPC technology that allows you to actually sign transactions and perform Web three actions within the app, all the way to Coinbase Wallet, which is our truly Web three product. You see a product portfolio here that matches this intention of wanting us to. Um, focus on growing the entire ecosystem, not just being a first party centralized institution, but focusing on something that we call internally our, our you know, product 3.0 manifesto, which is put in place by Brian and, and Surajit, our um, past chief product officer, to focus on being a Web3 first company. And I think this um, collaboration between Rocket Pool and Coinbase reflects that attitude. We are not a you know, a self-focused centralized institution. We want to focus on growing the entire ecosystem. Yeah. What one of the one of the ways also um, look at it is, so Coinbase is is one of those kind of so crypto in general, um, Rocket Pool, uh, Ethereum. You know, all of it is on this adoption curve, and um, as we as we go along the adoption curve, we, we're still really in the early adopters uh, sort of phase. Uh, we are breaking into the early majority, um, but you know, to get kind of the the early majority and the the, the kind of the rest of the majority, you need you need people like um, Coinbase as those gateways, um, and so that's why um, you know that's why it's in kind of important because it means that DeFi protocols can actually have the you know the positive impact that we're aiming to have uh, because we can extend our reach um to to those people so yeah that, that's that's how kind of how uh, we see it as well mm. all right let's let's talk uh let's talk shanghai so can one of you guys maybe set us up for this conversation and just explain give give maybe the 101 on shanghai 
when it's happening, what's happening. Uh, maybe John, I'll pick on you for this one. And then would like to get your guys' view in, ter in terms of like, what's the second order impact and like, what's actually going to happen here? Sure. So um, the TLDR is that, you know, as the Ethereum community, we have over the last couple of years been working towards a transition from proof of work to proof of stake consensus as a mechanism to increase the overall security of the network and bring down energy consumption. The huge milestone that we hit last year was the merge. The merge was the um, on-chain deviation towards proof of stake consensus. Um, and we have been working in that paradigm flawlessly, seamlessly. It's been really impressive actually to watch um, that transition happen and to the whole chain to continue to move forward. Now, a sort of fast follow, so to speak, from that upgrade was the ability to do ETH withdrawals or the opportunity to kind of exit your validator and get your principal of your 32 ETH increments back if you so choose, because otherwise it's been locked up. Now, LSDs, liquid staking tokens have been a kind of um, remedial solution for that lockup period, but ultimately your underlying ETH right now is locked on chain until we get to the next hard fork upgrade of Ethereum, which we have dubbed Shanghai, also heard Chappella because there's like the Sepoy line, Capella, like there's like, you know, the execution layer, the consensus layer, but whether you hear um, Chappella or you hear Shanghai, both of those are the ref referring to the upgrade that should happen seemingly on target by around mid to end of March, at which point on chain, you'll be able to um, submit unstaking requests to the protocol. You will be in an exit queue that is governed by the protocol of how much they allow unstaking to happen. And then as we work through that protocol, users will be starting to receive their unstaked vanilla ETH. And we now have, in my mind, sort of completed the um, full scope of what was needed for the transition to proof of stake. Darren, you want to walk us through the impact of this just on the staking market? Yeah. So uh, first of all, it's it's very, very exciting. Um, yeah. It's it's the culmination really of proof of stake. Without without this, we, we don't really have proof of stake. It, it, <laughs> it, is actually, it is actually a remarkable feat of like open source code. And I, 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 I really think that like, you know, people see these like EIP something, 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 and they're like, oh, that's great. There's like this other thing, like crypto-y thing that I don't really get. I, I, I really think this like... Uh, even people outside of crypto should be applauding, like any technology mm -hmm. should be applauding at like this massive feat of technology that has been pushed through over a many, many, many year roadmap, which yeah. is, I think it's really cool. I don't know. The, the research, the research effort, the the development effort, I mean, there are lots of teams working on this and they, they all kind of uh, interoperate and, and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it is, it's a, it's a massive exercise. Um, but uh, yeah, so withdrawals are withdrawals are really exciting. Um, as John said, uh, it's it's very very close, um, and they're they're come, we're kind of finishing off the, the testing um, of that now. How it kind of affects the affects the market is that, I mean, to be honest, uh, what it really does is it okay, very macro. Um, it kind of further de-risks Ethereum staking. That's the that's the biggest um, thing, the yeah. biggest takeaway. Um, the merge de-risk the execution risk of actually moving to proof of stake, um, and now um, you know withdrawals actually de-risks it from a a staker's perspective. So there are a lot. There's a lot of people waiting on the sidelines that um, you know aren't necessarily crazy enough to lock their money away uh, for a a non-determinate amount of time. Um, and so, you know, I'm surprised how much there is staked, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so, uh, so now that that is uh, implemented, it means that you can you can become a validator, you can run it for a few months or years. Uh, it's mostly years, uh, um, and then you can unstake uh, kind of when you when you like. As as John said, there is this like execute, so we don't know um, kind of how long uh, or what, how that's going to behave in terms of. You know, how many validators, how long it'll take you to exit and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, the essentially you can stake and unstake. Um, and that's a that's a big deal. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of people on the sidelines that either did not want to do that um because of the lockup 
or could not for um, particular kind of uh, you know, regulatory reasons or, or some or you know, compliance reasons and that sort of thing. So that's that's a that's going to be a big deal. Um, in terms of the actual protocols themselves, um, I mean, I, I can t- tell from our perspective, it it does actually make us it doesn't actually make that much of a difference from a liquid staking perspective. Um, uh, people can unstake um, from Rocket Pool whenever they like, anyway, uh, as long as we put liquidity. Um, so, you know, it, what it really does is it increases that liquidity, it increases the liquidity to unstake. Um, it also um, potentially increases the APR slightly because um, a lot more of those rewards are being compounded. Um, and so, you know, so they're, they're kind of like the two, the two things from a liquid staking perspective. Um, well, sorry, three things. They're, you know, de-risking, slightly more yield, um, and um, uh, yeah, so yeah. I'd also add on the de-risking side, I think one what, like one metric for measurement is um, looking at the training discount of any given LSD versus the ETH that it represents. So whether in the A token model, the basic model, or the C token model, uh, generally these assets you know trade at some proportion to the fair value, representing kind of the redemption value of how many ETH units you would get underneath that token. And historically, what we've seen, like if you go back to periods of high volatility, um, I think of like the Terra Luna collapse, like around there, you saw these trading discounts widen pretty dramatically because people just, I think in general, were in a risk off mode and were kind of scared about the total possibility of collapse around all sorts of different crypto systems. Now, since the merge, you saw those uh, trading discounts go much tighter, like you would see um, SDE trade kind of under negative 1% on its trading discount. And that kind of also represents that de-risking that happened with the merge. And what I would expect to happen is after Shanghai and after the point where the exit queue has come down a bit, we should see trading discounts go converge towards zero or near zero over the long term. And it represents the fact that the arbitrage loop of going between uh, LSD to vanilla uh, stake deep, to vanilla stake deep, to stake deep, and that whole circle is now bi-directional because if it trades at a small discount, you can short long in one direction, or if it trades at a slight premium, just as in today, you can art that out uh, pretty quickly. So that's what we would also expect is that kind of these LSDs will trade closer in line because of the de-risking mm-hmm. to the fair value. So in a, just, just to add a little bit more to that as well, so... Our ETH, which is our, our liquid staking token, um, has actually been trading at a premium, um, like one point something percent, um, and that's mainly due to the fact that uh, there's a, such a huge demand for our ETH, um, and we're a decentralized um, protocol, which means that we need node operators to spin up, you know, validators, um, and on that side of things, you know, they've been uh, kind of spinning up um, uh, validators, but not quite meeting the demand on the our ETH side, um, and so there's actually like an ARB opportunity. And there, in terms of you know spinning up a, um, a rocket pool mini pool, you can actually earn an extra one point three percent because you are being um, uh, by creating by creating a um, a validator. Hmm. And what we what we're going to see is the opposite as well. So um, if um, if this as, as John said, you know if if we're trading at, if the you know liquid staking token is trading a discount, then there's an ARP going the other way. Which means, um, so you know, we, we we can see kind of like validators using that as an as an arbitration, as a you know, as an arb mechanism to um, steady the, the the price of the liquid staking token. Hey everyone, quick break from Empire to tell you about another Blockworks channel that I know you're gonna love. I've been in crypto full time for five years and have always struggled with one thing, which is keeping up with the next big trend. As soon as I wrap my head around MEV. Ronda app chains. As soon as I wrap my head around app chains, we're on to liquid staking derivatives. I'm sure you've been there. Blockworks Research has solved that problem for me. Our team puts research, data, governance, proposal updates, models, and more into one really easy to use platform so I can always stay ahead of the curve. If I don't understand something, for example, I just bought the platform, I can search for an L1, I can search for a protocol, up the platform of blockworksresearch.com. I searched the term. There's always an amazing amount of insight in a really consumable way. Uh, right now, you can subscribe to the platform. It's 2500 bucks a year. 
or 900 bucks a quarter. Hopefully you can uh, make more than $208 a month by using the platform and you can't, you're probably in the wrong business. But if you're not ready to subscribe to the platform today, you can subscribe to the research team's free newsletter. Uh, you can follow their Twitter handles today. Links in the show notes. Trust me, once you do that, you're going to want to subscribe to the platform. If you are ready to, uh, to subscribe right now, I got you guys with a little hookup. Empire listeners get a 10% discount for the first 50 people who use the code Empire10. Got your back. Check out the links in the, sh in the description to find out more. Now, let's get back to the show. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure if you guys have seen the the middle of the bell curve meme about basically what will what will happen uh uh around around the unlock, right? So like the middle of the bell curve take, well, I I would say the middle of the bell curve take is like uh like oh what like when Shanghai unlocks, like millions of ETH will get sold onto the market. I'm not buying ETH yet. I'm going to wait until after that happens and then I'm going to rotate into ETH. I would I would call that the middle of the bell curve take. Um the right side and the left side of the bell curve take is probably like pretty bullish on the unlock. So, but I'm curious if you guys would agree with me in, in that sense. I, I think I agree with you. Um, I, I am definitely more in the camp that I think, um, like, well, speaking of curves, I guess, um, my view is generally a J curve of what's going to happen after Shanghai, whereas you're going to see in the near term, all the yeah. first one to eight months or so, there's going to be net unstaking and maybe net selling of ETH. Um, as people feel, for example, uh, users just got unlocked. Um, about 6% of their validator was accumulated rewards. So that now has a tax impact, right? And so at least to some extent, you're going to see some people unstaking, maybe even just their rewards in order to sell on the market. So I would expect that to happen in the short term. But just to all the things we mentioned, that J curve starts to inflect kind of once the exit queue kind of works itself out and you now get to a more steady state where people are saying, ah, this whole thing is de-risk more. It is um, a more stable system that has this two-way door of staking um, and unstaking. And I do expect growth, like net staking growth to happen from that point on. Um, it's a good, that, the, that's it, a, I think, yeah, I think that's a really good take, John. Yeah, I think that's a good take, like net, like, I guess that that bell curve meme, whatever, it depends on your time horizon, right? So like yes. short term, yeah, yes. probably a bunch of sell pressure, long term, very bullish because people see that it actually works. So yeah, yeah. I think that there is de there's definitely um, so the partial withdrawals thing um, is is actually an interesting mechanism. So so anything above thirty two ETH once when we once Shanghai is delivered, anything above thirty two ETH will be withdrawable. Well, actually, will will will. Um, as soon as uh, there's, there's some other things going on there, but um, uh, just to simplify it, yeah. Um, so anything above 32 ETH will come back. So that's actually an important mechanism because people won't necessarily have to exit their validator to like pay tax, for example. Um, and we are in the bear market as well, so that makes a, a little bit of a, a kind of a difference. But um, uh, so you know, if we if that partial withdrawal comes back, the, as I said, as John said, there might be this initial. I'm selling. I'm selling for tax, um, but ultimately, I'm quite, kind of seeing people use that and wanting to um, compound their rewards. And so, what I'm actually expecting is that uh, a lot of that will get restaked, um, either via you know um, spinning up more validators, um, or um, by using a liquid staking token. So I, sus yeah. I suspect there's there's going to be a lot of that as well. Um, but yeah, there may well be a little bit of short term win. With self attack. Yeah. And Jason, I would say that I think that um, the bigger phenomenon is going to be market share reshuffling than it is going to be like net unstaking or, or you know, net staking. Um, I think we'll see more changes in market share. Um, and this is like, you know, a, definitely a hot topic that I'm talking about with my teams. Um, but I think just general principles that are guiding my thoughts here are that number one, um, LSDs are going to be just as important in a post Shanghai world as they are now. Uh, maybe just as is a, a fluffy term, but very important, still very important. And the reason why is because there's always going to be an exit queue when you want to unstake. There's at least the, um, or there's always going to be a queue. There's always going to be the exit period, which is a minimum wait time of like two to 30 second epoch, something like 27 hours, I think, um, that you're going to need to wait whenever you unstake. So some people who have immediate liquidity demands are always going to prefer to have an LSD 
where they can get in and out of staking immediately at their discretion. Second reason why LSDs are going to be still extremely important post Shanghai is because it unlocks a lot of capital efficiency. You can now use your LSD either for um, on-chain activities like in borrow lend protocols in order to get an additive uh, rewards rate there for, for depositing it and, and lending it. Or another approach um, is that you can even deposit these at centralized institutions and prime brokers for um, that collateral requirement. So if you are taking leverage as a crypto hedge fund, for example, um, you would probably prefer a collateral asset that's actually paying you money and earning you interest as right. you go. Right. So I do expect um, that even post Shanghai, like it certainly makes a native staking a lot more attractive because you're now no longer in this forced lockup. Um, but I still think that over the long term, we will see LSDs reign supreme as the premier choice for staking. All right. So I have a, I have a couple maybe more quantitative questions on the back of that. Darren, I'll throw this to you. And then John, I'm going to ask you a similar question. Today, uh, I, I fixed my market share numbers, by the way, John. I got the Hill Dobby doing dashboard up. We're, we're, we're good to go. So today, Lido has, a, <clears throat> according to this dashboard, 29% market share. What is Lido's market share if we're doing this podcast? So let's call it same time next year. It's very difficult to tell. Uh, I would I would expect it to be lower, though. <laughs> Um, uh, there's a, there's a few reasons for that. As I said, um, that unlock is then is now possible. Um, there are a lot of people who are particularly from a risk perspective, are, are looking at diversifying, um, across different, uh, liquid staking protocols. Um, and I mean, there's, there's different versions of risk. Um, but obviously there's this kind of smart contract list or there's, or there's the risk that you know, Lido plays, which is having too much, um, too much stake and that sort of thing. Um, so there's, de there's definitely a lot of that kind of, uh, management of risk. Um, so there will be a reshuffling um, because of that, uh, there will be a reshuffling because, you know, people prefer different black brands or, or that sort of thing, um, or different, different, um, uh, APRs. Um, so there's, there's definitely that, uh, so I, I would imagine that their, um, the, their percentage will be lower. Um, one thing which is, which is a rockable specific thing is that we've got like a big Atlas release, which will actually kind of at minimum three X our capacity, um, for, um, as well. So one of the things that has been kind of slowing us down is the fact that we are a decentralized protocol and we have to scale in a particular way. Um, and with our Atlas release, um, that uh, situation improves quite a lot. So um, obviously yeah. that's a very biased, very biased thing, um, but we, we expect to have more market share um, post Shanghai as well. So we think Lido's market share is going down and Rocket Pools is going up. <laughs> You've implied that. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't think you were gonna, I didn't think you were gonna say that. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not saying that, you're saying that. <laughs> um, I guess, John, maybe let me try to make this more of a, and if I ask you the same question, I think I'll get a similar answer. Lido's going down and, and CBE, their Coinbase is going up. What is, um like, like obviously you think that, what is something that like could get in the way of that? Or like, what's something that either you guys could fail at or like that Lido could do well at that would maybe like invalidate that, that idea? Well, here is I mean, one thing that's been top of mind to me which is that when I look at the you know, LSD market, um, one analogy that I like, you know, I spend a lot of time, too much time, you know, researching all sorts of different industries and understanding the history of those industries. But one of the, I think the, the uh, markers here that's a pretty good analogy is the ETF market. Um, and the way I think about this is that LSDs generally are representing a staked ETH position at whatever you know, provider you are trusting. And of course, the security of that underlying ETH is incredibly important in choosing that supply. But then when it becomes deciding you know, between one supplier versus another, you can kind of then lean on that ETF analogy to say that when you look at the ETF markets, there is often a winner takes most ETF or strategy. 
And the reason why is, you know, my, my background and my first job out of school was, you know, on Wall Street, then I was at a hedge fund for a while. And the reason why is because when you are investing large sums of capital, you are pretty tied to how much liquidity exists and how much trading volume happens in a given strategy, which, uh, or in a given security, um, or, uh, just product, uh, because I don't view Ellis with liquid state tokens as securities. Uh, but if you just view in any product, the, um, overall demand is generally kind of this flywheel and, and a bit of a network effect between having more trading volume so that there's more liquidity for a big institution to get in and out that then drives AUM into the ETF which then allows more natural buyers and sellers, which then turns that flywheel right. of liquidity, liquidity to get liquidity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so if we think of it in that model, I think that would be the risk factor, right? To your question of like, what could get in the way of Lido continuing to grow and, and STE growing as a bigger percentage of total? It is probably that. That is probably my concern of something that could derail it. And what I hope to happen is that we see the community and that social layer continue to push on upper thresholds for how much market share we want a single staking provider to have. So then mm. thought that ultimately we drive long-term network security as our top priority mm. as Ethereum's. Okay. So then let me ask an incentive-based question about post-Shanghai world. So if you look at our ETH, which is Rocket Pool. Uh, so our ETH swap volume on Balancer increased pretty dramatically after turning on incentives back in September. Um, it, I, I think right now the most liquid market for CB ETH is on Coinbase, but the CB ETH pool also does have this curve gauge, right? Like AK, like CRV emissions can flow there. Do you see Coinbase voting on curve to drive incentives and on-chain liquidity in like a post-Shanghai world? Um, I would say that we look, uh, look, I'll start by saying we haven't made any specific decisions there and wouldn't be, you know, willing to, to speak to what we plan to do in those regards. Um, but I would say that we ultimately realize that there is a lot of advantage to driving on chain liquidity as well as off chain liquidity in centralized workers. One of the reasons is to a point that Darren made earlier, which I really like, which is like, Maslow's hierarchy of needs when driving utility is that in order to get into all the kind of, you know, premier, sexy new DeFi applications, you generally need to be integrated into the bar lend protocols. And for the bar lend protocols to adopt you, they need to be able for their liquidators to have enough liquidity to liquidate any bad debt. So they don't end up with, you know, bad debt on their, on their balance sheet. That means that ultimately, uh, DEX liquidity is the base layer of importance for on-chain utility. And you can generally think of that metric, the success metric for how well integrated you are in on-chain liquidity is by your slippage percents at X dollar intervals of how much of a sell size you would need measured by some aggregator of the one-inch route. So if you kind of put it in that framework and you say, okay, well, like we need to drive on-chain liquidity and liquidity providers, um, in order to make sure that that slippage is low on large trade sizes, then Coinbase and I would assume Rocket Pool as well would be angling to do anything we really can to try and drive enough of that uh, liquidity provision on chain. Um, how we go about doing that, I think that's you know up for discussion. There's a lot of different approaches, but it does speak to a critical need there. Yeah, Darren, what do you think? I mean, like, will you will you guys have to continue some of these uh, incentives after Shanghai? Uh, yes, I, I think we'll, um, we'll need to can kind of continue it. We're, we're going to, um, assess it as we go. Um, we have a, we have like a management committee within the DAO, um, that, that kind of after our, our incentive program, um, we're definitely, uh, looking at it. So, so we, we were, we were quite reluctant to get into liquidity incentives. Um, we, as a, as a long, it, it worked. yeah, yeah it, 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 it did, it did work. Yeah, it did, it did work. Um. I think in in the long term, I think we will we'll try to kind of um, and dial it back, but I, I I can't see us at the moment. I mean, uh, the main the main thing that we needed to do was get enough. So there is there is like as I said, there's there's a there's a point at which you need to get to. 
you need to get to that point to be able to get into lending markets because of those, that, that, those degradations. Yeah. You need to get a certain amount of liquidity out there so that there's enough volume so that you can have oracles. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, you need to have that bootstrap um, to be able to get there. Um, now, I, I suspect we will carry that on, um, uh, but you know, we'll, we 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 kind of assess that on a on a kind of a, a monthly basis anyway. Yeah, how do you see the fee market evolving? So CBE, I might botch some of these numbers, but roughly twenty five percent, which pretty high fees, I'd say. Rocket Pool nodes, I think, can choose their own rate between like five to let's call it twenty percent. Um, uh, so at, at, actually, so now it's uh, so it's a little bit more complicated. So now it's a fi- now it's fifteen percent uh, as a fixed it's a fixed fifteen percent. Um, okay. But but previous but what uh, our ETH holders actually get the average across their whole network. Um, and um, we did have a floating commission rate um, kind of at the beginning. So so some some uh, node operators are like twenty percent, some are like five percent, and everyone in between. Um, and but. From now on, it's fifteen percent. Uh, post Atlas, actually, it's going to be fourteen percent. So we're actually lowering it. Nice. Um, so yeah. Um, well, what I would add there is that you know twenty five percent is our our baseline fee for uh, ETH staking and for CBE, and what is available to us uh, are fee rebates, and that is something that you know we've written into our user agreement and is is clear. And so larger uh, investors institutions, other large uh, large and advanced traders and investors who would like to discuss those fee rebates with us are you know, absolutely welcome to reach out to us through our prime broker, through our sales team and so forth uh, to discuss kind of volume-based fee rebates. Um, and I think over time, what I would expect is that it will be a competitive market, but that there is some um, kind of underlying floor, which is an institutional large investor's comfort with the underlying security model of the state deed. And I think that is one thing where us at Coinbase, we take a lot of pride in being the most trusted provider in the market among centralized exchanges, all the way to, you know, for all of our products, like most trusted gotcha. and easiest to use become top priorities for us. And so building the really simple user experiences for retail and also keeping the assets incredibly secure underlying it are what we kind of always will use to baseline the value that we're providing to customers. Yeah. John, you mentioned this word like Ethereans a couple of times. Like I think everyone on this call is like very like pro EVM, pro ETH world. Even Coinbase as a company, I would say is like a very like ETH heavy company. Um, uh, Lido announced that they're going cross chain. So I think they're like launching with, on Cosmos, maybe Neutron, I think it was. I, I got to revisit that, but I'm, I'm curious to get both your guys' takes on like going, like cro- like cross ch- going to other chains, staking on other chains. Like, what's the strategy there? I uh, sure I can I can start by saying like, yep, Lido, you know, has for a while um, had different state like ST tokens for different chains. Um, they have their ST Soul, I believe, uh, and they have they did have. Um, One's on Terra and Luna, uh, rest in peace up there. And, um, you know, I think there's, they'll probably be adding more protocols as well. Uh, at Coinbase, we have uh, staking programs for more than just ETH. And we are looking over time to add more staking programs and any ones that we feel like we can um, dutifully add for our customers in a safe and secure way. We will be adding those over time. And to maybe more specifically answer your question around the potential for LSDs for other networks, I think that is also a possibility, something that we are uh, exploring and considering. And it definitely comes down to, I think, a function of how valuable is that instant liquidity for that other uh, native blockchain token with ETH, of course, that was kind of the no-brainer because it was all locked up until Shanghai. So it was you know, a no-brainer to focus here on the ETH side. But when looking at other tokens, you do need to account, like, what is the unstaking illiquidity period look like on that chain? What is the total DeFi adoption look like on that chain? To speak to that utility argument of how much use can you get on that chain? And then I think third, there's also a little bit of a lens where you need to take a longer-term view 
on the success and adoption of that protocol. If you take that view on, like if you think, if you're working with a network where you see developers in Exodus, not actually building, not a lot of new innovations, I'd say that probably leads less confidence in wanting to really invest in that protocol. Uh, but I, just to be very clear, you know, while I maybe individually love Ethereum and I was, you know, kind of born and bred on Ethereum as kind of the very first place I really subbed in, um, I do take a multi-chain view of the future. I think there are a lot of other chains out there that are valid, working on unique and different architectures. And I think there's probably in that design space of uh, different protocol architectures, different consensus mechanisms, probably other chains that will be best suited for certain applications over the long term. So I'm by no means a um, a, a single-minded person on this. Um, I've got an open mind and do think that you know, there's a lot of other protocols that do have merit and there's probably opportunity to build staking and LSDs there. That was very uh, PR friendly. PR, PR friendly. <laughs> I'll play you, John. I, I, well, the PR people who are listening are going to then thank me. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. They're going to be happy with you there. Uh, did, Darren, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, our approach is, is a bit different um, in the sense that um, so we, we in the future, we're not going to say no, we won't go to any other chains. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll kind of adapt as the you know, as the future unfolds. Um, but for us, we have kind of a philosophy of do one thing and do it really, really well. We, in Ethereum, Ethereum is the biggest market um, kind of by far. So uh, it's worth spending our time in that market and getting it right. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we've got enough work at working on Rocket Pool in Ethereum to last us decades. So, uh, so not so you, yeah, not years. No, 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 no decades. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, we, we we want to do it really, really well. Um, we want to focus uh, and be the, the kind of best that we can. So, um, that's that's kind of where we we've taken. As I said, you know, as as the future unfolds, we, we it may change, but at, at this very moment, we're we're focused on just on the yeah. Um, uh, future. I want to talk like some like future of the market stuff as we think about wrapping this up like fu future of the market for staking um at large one question that i had here is like will lsds subsume staking or will it like how what's the relationship between staking and lsds and specifically like the size of the lsd market relative to staking maybe john if you want to take that one first sure i think over the very long term i would expect um if you break out kind of liquid staking um, or LSDs in the ETH that underlies it versus native staking, of which a subset are those DIY home stakers. Um, my hunch is that over the long term, LSDs will subsume and take the majority share of total staked ETH on the network. And my reason for believing that does come down to a couple of the points we mentioned before. Uh, number one being the utility factor of it, uh, being able to use it both as depository collateral that earns you interest or to be able to lend it out bar lend protocols or additive interest and so forth. Basically just being able to use that capital rather than just having it locked up in your own uh, of value. I think the other piece of that is the fact that um, users will demand liquidity and even like in even in a world very far away from Shanghai, once we have ETH withdrawals, there's still that 27 hour wait time and any exit queue that uh, still exists on exiting Ethereum staking. So that involves some lockup and some illiquidity that I think some users, especially the larger, bigger institutional investors are going to prefer than the good solution. Um, so I think for you know probably those two major reasons, I think over the long term, um, LSDs will be the preferred method for staking on Ethereum. So... So I agree, but I, I would kind of temper it slightly. So there, there are a couple of things. So I agree that um, liquid staking will probably be the um, uh, will be the majority versus uh, native staking. But I also so at Rocket Pool, obviously, we are trying to lower that barrier of entry for na native staking as well. Um, so n not just for liquid staking. The liquid staking you don't need to any to run a node at all, but on the on the running a node side, we're trying to make it easier and easier, um, and lowering that collateral level so that you, um, so more and more people can do it. So we get more and more home stakers 
Um, so, uh, and on that side of things, you have on the, obviously on the liquid staking side, as John said, you've got this liquidity, you've got this uh, utility, um, uh, and you don't have to run a node, so it's, it's super convenient. Um, but on the node operator side, you have you earn more. The yield is 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 um, a particularly um, a, that's a particularly remarkable where you, you get a commission on the the ETH you're staking on behalf of the pool. You you earn more um, from that, and um, and so I, I do see kind of institutions and home stakers alike looking at that and going, I want to do that, um, even though it's slightly harder. Although we're kind of as I said, lowering that barrier of entry from a technical perspective. Um, and from a collateral perspective, so that more and more people can actually do that. And to be honest, that's a good situation. It means that we are you know, further decentralizing Ethereum. You, know, you yeah. can get more and more people actually um, uh, coming from staking. So although although I say that you know, I think liquid staking certainly will be the bulk, um, uh, we're, we're trying to grow that, that um, kind of na- native staking pie as well. And it's, it's worth just tagging along that to say that like, the risk of the future that I painted is centralization. And I think I applaud all the efforts from Rocket Pool and even Lido with their V2, where they talked about the smart router and the kind of a permissionless entrance into the staking pool as very important uh, actions to decentralize in every possible access. access. Um, that is key to preventing that risk factor of centralization of a single LSD provider. If centralization is the risk, John, like aren't you guys driving centralization of staking by being a centralized exchange? Um, I think, you know, look, I think there's a fair argument to that. Uh, We are a centralized institution. And one of the reasons that we are, it kind of comes down to the Coinbase principle of being the easiest to use. Um, we want to be most trusted. We want to be easiest to use. And part and parcel for that is allowing, especially those um, newbies to Ethereum and to crypto in general, to have an extremely easy way to stake and participate. Um, ultimately, providing a centralized solution is the easiest approach for onboarding new users to crypto and to Ethereum at large. And I think there are trade offs in any approach that you take. But one of the benefits of being a centralized institution and having um, you know, a, a more centralized version of an LSD is that we can provide a super simple experience to a user who maybe has heard about crypto, maybe was told about it by a friend or read some articles and needs a more, e- a, a more simple and familiar experience for onboarding for their first talk. Can you talk about the regulatory side of things? I forget if I was... I, there's one question I wasn't supposed to ask you guys, but I forget it. And I feel like this might've been it. Our producer told me, so I don't know if either of you guys can talk about this, but Kraken obviously just settled with the SEC. It was like 30 million bucks. Um, seems like folks are coming down pretty hard on staking right now. Um, can, can either of you guys talk about this? Skip, what, what, what are your thoughts on regula- regulation right now? Like how you weigh the risks and the rewards? What, um, let me jump in to answer your question the best I can. <laughs> and the, the, the way I can I feel like she, I feel like she's going to get mad at me here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, hopefully she'll view me as, as, as coached well here. And, and here's the answer that I give, which is that we are different than what Kraken was doing. And um, I think great resources here are what Brian has said on Twitter, what Paul Graywall, our chief legal officer, has said on Twitter and in the blog post. And some of the key points to mention here are that we have first and foremost as Coinbase always disclosed to our staking customers of what happens with the assets. And we've always mentioned this in the user agreement. Um, We at all times maintain a one-to-one relationship uh, between any assets that you give us and what we have title over. So, you know, we are, we hold your assets one-to-one. That is a, a key principle. And then lastly, and very importantly, when a user tells us that they want to stake, we go and we put that stake on chain. We actually do what the user has told us to do. And so these are some key components that make you know our staking program different and very what I would consider by the book um, to more closely and 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 rep, more closely replicate what the native on-chain experience feels like. 
uh, all in a process to ensure and to make very clear that we do not believe that each staking is a security and we do not believe that the way that we are providing staking to those customers is a security either. The Darren, are you allowed to give a less kosher answer? I can't, I'm not going to. I'm not going to comment on the actual kind of uh, regulations, but I, I'll kind of reiterate some of the the stuff that John was saying. Uh, so the staking that we provide is transactional. Uh, it is uh, a, a transaction between uh, a liquid staker and a node operator. The node operator is providing a service to the uh, to the liquid staker. Um, every yeah, every um, uh, dollar, every ETH uh, that goes into the system is being staked. Uh, they're, they're, we don't do any kind of management of that of those funds. Uh, it is all just um, being staked uh, in, yeah. in the protocol. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> like I'm, all I can all, all we can really say is is the nature of our business uh, and and kind of uh, let, let, let that unfold. I, I actually think one of the worst things for the regulatory side of staking was two things: was one calling it interest, and two calling it a freaking derivative. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> why? Why did we yeah. use the word derivative here? I like use any. I was very reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, call it a derivative. Come on, come on. Yeah. Uh, let's let's. Yeah. We like yeah. the term liquid staking tokens. Uh, I, because we've gone on such as liquid staking tokens, and I noticed you use rewards instead of interest. So, uh, there's, uh, I'm, but that's smart. Yeah. Like, I, I actually don't think the SEC really understands what, I think if they really understood what staking is, it's a totally fine thing to do. It's, it's just like securing a network, right? It's, uh, yeah. there's, it, it, it's like a, the, such a great act to do. The, the other, the other thing, but particularly with kind of like DeFi protocols, is that everything is transparent like uh you know you can every every dollar every eth that we stake every everything is on chain and in fact you know we have we have a whole ecosystem of community projects that uh that um use that transparency uh and show people you know where where the money is and what's 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 happening with it so um, and to how kind of hold us to account that we are actually staking everything and, and that sort yeah. of thing. So, um, yeah, so it, it's a very, it's a very different, it's a very different thing, but yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not a regulator. <laughs> it might be, you know, it's helpful also to just ground us that like proof of stake is a consensus mechanism that replaces proof of work. And these are really the two major production, um, widely adopted consensus mechanisms used in crypto and proof of stake is superior. Like it is far less energy intensive. And that is something that many people, including uh, politicians, have raised as a concern for the long term viability of crypto. Um, and so a system where we have proof of stake is a better system than one without it. And I think we should also, you know, just really think critically about that. And our regulators should as well that provided you believe that crypto provides value to the world and Duh, it absolutely does. It is a permissionless system that is allows anyone around the world to participate and interact in a peer-to-peer -peer method and exchange value. It is incredibly valuable. As long as you provide that, then you need some computer science tactic for securing the state and, uh, and right access to the uh, data model of the chain. And proof of stake is a better consensus mechanism for governing that data than proof of work for, for both the security and the amount of security it provides and the less uh, amount of energy intensity that it requires. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think I think the last the last question I had here, guys, is um around like uh LS like uh, liquid staking moving to L twos. So if you actually just look at a lot of the on chain activity in crypto, it's starting to move to some of these L twos, and you you would have to assume that LSDs would also uh, like liquid stake would also move to L twos. I'm I'm curious, is, is this the way that you see things going as well? Um, I can jump in to just say that I think the future of Ethereum is going to be, or the future of usability on Ethereum is going to be built on top of L2s. And I love a saying that the bankless guys have, which is that like um, the future of L1 is for robots, meaning that it's more of like the settlement layer for all of the layer twos that exist. And I think that's a good framework 
as a reminder that, um, look, even now, like in this bear market, we are past like the ultrasound barrier, as it's called. Like we are in a net deflationary paradigm right now, just based on on chain usage. And that, remember, is you know a function of what the fees are to actually transact on chain. If we're at these fee levels, you know, in this status of a bear market, when we can get to the next bull market, fees are going to skyrocket just like they have in the last two bull markets that participated in it. And when that happens, um, the number of use cases that can feasibly exist on layer one um, drop down pretty substantially because of the transaction costs that exist there. So you have to imagine that, especially as we enter the next bull market, the new user experiences and dApps of the subsequent bull market are largely going to be built on the L2s. And it just makes sense that you're going to want to have LSDs that represent your state ETH on L1 to be usable in those application experiences that will increasingly exist and be built on layer twos. So I do view it as pretty, pretty darn important. Darren, I would assume you agree there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the L2 future is looking very, very bright. Um, we're already seeing, um, obviously massive TVLs into L2s, uh, reduction in costs. So they so, you know, all of that is working, um, in terms of, uh, liquid staking tokens, uh, it, if you hold a liquid staking token, you are staking. It doesn't matter whether you hold it on L1 or you hold it on L2. If you acquire it on L1 or if you acquire it on L2, it doesn't matter. Um, you are still staking, you are still earning um, that kind of those rewards. So uh, so what kind of deployment to L2s really mean is that people can access these um, uh, uh, this this product um, in, at a much cheaper uh, kind of rate. you know so so you can you can actually get involved um, it's, it's much cheaper um, uh, to use it on and then you can use the, there's, there'll be these burgeoning L2 ecosystems. Each L2 will have their own uh, kind of you know, style, have their own um, like lending platforms, products, um, or you know, non-financial stuff as well. Um, and so you know, each one you'll be able to use for different things. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you hold it, um, you, if you hold it on L2 or not. Um, so that's that's how we kind of see it. We see it as, actually, we see L2s as a, as a from Deploying at our liquid staking token to L2 is actually a UX thing um, and, and an access thing. You know, we want we want um, people to have ex you know, accessibility to these things, and having them on L2 doesn't necessarily give you that. Um, having on an L2 does. Um, we we actually kind of won an OP grant um, to incentivize liquidity on um, optimism, um, and that's kind of been helping right. as well to kind of drive that. Guys, great great conversation. Um... Really, really interesting, or just to get your guys' thoughts around the future of staking, liquid staking, market share, Shanghai, anything else, final points here? Maybe a final point is just um, future of staking is bright. Uh, you know, don't let the FUD, don't let regulation by enforcement um, scare you out of what I believe is going to be one of the most important verbs of the future of Ethereum. Of course, you know, we been in a world of buy, sell, trade, of store, send, uh, receive, and you know, increasingly in the last and prior bull market, more on-chain usage. And I do believe that staking is here to stay and it's going to be a critically important third uh, of the future of Ethereum. Actually, it's also kind of like a, a primitive. You know, um, we'll see kind of liquid staking tokens being used in some very interesting and innovative ways. And that's so innovation is actually something that's going to come out of this as well. Um, and you know, we're already seeing some protocols kind of use um, liquid staking tokens in, in cool ways, and we should see more and more of that in the future. We interviewed Jesse, uh, Jesse, the head of ecosystem or head of protocol at Coinbase last week on the podcast, and I think he said it well, which is it's a bear market for prices and it's a bull market for on chain activity. So I think he said it well. and. Darren and John just, yeah, appreciate, pre appreciate your guys' insight and, uh, insights and also just appreciate what you guys do for the space, moving the, uh, the staking world forward. So thank you. Let's build. Let's build. Let's build. <laughs> Thanks guys. Yeah.